Okay, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, this is the third presentation in uh, this semester's speaker series on the capitalist mode of power. Uh, our presenter today is Dr. James McMahon. Uh, he teaches at uh, the University of Toronto. James McMahon was a PhD student here uh, not too long ago, and uh, he wrote uh, a fascinating dissertation on Hollywood and how Hollywood over the past uh, few decades was able to actually reduce its risk dramatically by altering the nature of popular and mass culture. So that was a, a very stimulating work and it's available on the Bichler and Nitzan archives if you want to look for it. He's also written a few articles on the subject if you are not ready for a 400 page doorstopper, maybe you should start with the articles. So today he's going to speak about <coughs> uh, a topic that he titled, Is the Power of Mass Culture Profitable? And uh, knowing him from the past, I think this is going to be captivating as always. And he will speak for about uh, 30 minutes or so, then we will take a break and then maybe another 30 or 45 minutes. Uh, and after that, there will be question and answer period. Okay, thank you. James. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming. And so uh, with this title, I sort of just wanna maybe move first into uh, the way that I'm going to be structuring uh, this presentation. So what I first wanna do is just sort of give a brief, uh, sort of, I guess, a prologue that sort of maybe explains why I wrote the title of this presentation this way and sort of to frame it as a research question. Then what I would like to do is actually go into uh, some, of the, uh, some of my arguments that I actually made in my dissertation, but has been some of my other work of why uh, sort of a Marxist political economic approach runs into some problems when it actually starts to look at uh, the accumulation of value from culture, or even just tries to make an, an understanding of maybe what is sort of the mechanisms that is driving this thing. From there, I want to give sort of a brief bridge uh, into maybe why uh, the capitalist power uh, approach was so appealing to me uh, to actually use for some of my research. It's not really going to give a summary of the work, but what it will do is sort of try to demonstrate that there's a certain sort of outlook and or sort of we could call it a framework on how to actually analyze the different elements of mass culture or even the different elements of society in a way that doesn't maybe get into the same problems as Marxism. And then as a third part, the third part will actually be more uh, sort of an open research question. I will sort of explain, sort of give a, a small answer to is the uh, power of mass culture profitable, but I'll sort of sort of explain and share with you some of the graphs that I'm working on now to give you a context of how I may be trying to actually approach the problem. So if I can start with maybe just a bit of a, a short preamble, the preamble is really to sort of explain what maybe how I started this project. And the reason that that's important was because I didn't exactly have sort of a preconceived notion of how in fact I was actually going to start this research. And my background is actually not in economics. So when I started to focus more on economic papers or economic articles, both in Marxism and neoclassicism, I started to actually notice that there, I, was gonna, I was starting to get this almost uneasy feeling. And the uneasy feeling was sort of, I could frame it this way, that on the one hand, I, you know, I like to theorize, I like to think up ideas, I like to sort of say, well, maybe this is how, you know, either something like Hollywood works or something like another society works or how a different institution works. But then when I actually approached the models, I was sort of actually noticing that some of my own interests or some of my own assumptions would actually undermine some of the assumptions that were actually within those models or within those theories, which isn't automatically a bad thing. It's not about saying that these theories are absolutely correct, but I sort of noticed that in the realm of political economy, this problem seems to repeat itself, where you sort of have some political economic works that are sort of fuzzy with respect of how seriously they're maybe using their own assumptions. So they sometimes get very playful with some of their work, 
but at the same time, it's not always clear then what that actually maybe means for the underlying theory. So if I start to theorize what makes Hollywood profitable, as you'll see today, there's various elements in Hollywood. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with those. So the issue then is what are some of the ways that we're actually going to maybe sort of uh, you know, try to account for those and address those in a more theoretically robust way. Oh, sorry. So in for part one, if you don't mind, only because it's going to make me probably babble less, uh, I'm actually going to read just a few parts from, um, uh, from my dissertation, in fact, because it actually sort of, I think, is probably one of the places where I was probably maybe the most coherent, at least in comparison to how I talk, um, about how uh, there are certain problems within uh, Marxist political economy with particular focus on trying to understand how I could use any of this to maybe try to understand how capital is in fact accumulated from culture. So from the perspective of Marxist economics, any productive process in the capitalist mode of production, whether it takes place on a movie set, a car factory, a chemical plant, valorizes its commodities with the same value forming substance. Consequently, the concept of abstract labor is a keystone of the Marxist framework. It is the basis for the exchange of two commodities that are otherwise incommensurable with respect to their use values and formative elements of the concrete labor. So that's something that, I'm, uh, that might be familiar to uh, some of you in the audience. But what I started to do in this chapter was I started to break that down and look at particular parts with respect to what I'm interested in maybe trying to answer. And so one of them that sort of returned over and over and over in the literature is what you do with respect to an analysis of creativity or an analysis of artistic labor. So this is a subtitle called The Creativity and Artistry of Cultural Production. The creativity of the human imagination is not exclusive to cultural or artistic labor. Yet in the realm of art and culture, the problem of reducing concrete creativity to abstract labor is acute. It is unclear what becomes of the creative, artistic, and immaterial elements of cultural production when artistic labor is subsumed under capital and abstracted according to the forces of socially necessary abstract labor time. So by formulating a general theory of capital, Marx excluded works of art for being exceptional commodities. Artistic labor was not yet actually in the eyes of Marx formally subsumed under capital. So some might be familiar with his comparison between a unproductive artist like Milton and Balzac and then a productive artist uh, like a someone, I, I think as he phrased it, a writer making, uh, writing hack work for a political economic publisher. So instead, artistic labor was in a transitional stage, as it still included artists such as Milton and Balzac, who were neither alienated nor exploited uh, like the proletariat. The proletarian worker loses his individuality by being subsumed under an abstract social definition of productivity. Conversely, this classical individual artist is defined by her individual skill. She is her own measure of output and the duration of her labor is not benchmarked against a society-wide mass of homogeneous labor. Moreover, any broad standard of artistic productivity is potentially meaningless because artistic labor is not necessarily competing to produce the same artwork in less time. So for instance, when Picasso finished painting Guernica in 1937, it mattered little if Guernica took 10 days or 10 weeks to be completed. With no other Guernicas for comparison, it can never be determined whether the time it took Picasso to paint this unique artwork was socially necessary. And without a determinable quality of value on the basis of abstract labor time, the exchange value of Guernica cannot be expressed as X coats, Y yards of linen, or Z pounds of coffee. So the transitional stage of Marx's time has actually carried over into the contemporary area, at least in one really important aspect. Some artists, by virtue of their fame or talent, receive large sums of money for the concrete labor they perform as individuals. Thus, the nature of their artistic labor actually affects our understanding of this whole idea of joint work in mass culture. Rather than making it easier to claim that artistry and creativity 
are sort of beholden to socially necessary abstract labor time, joint work in mass culture retains aspects of what I just mentioned earlier, this sort of classical notion of bourgeois art. So for each branch of mass culture, music, film, theater, et cetera, some artists receive high wages for their, because their proper names are actually famous, just like the names of Milton, Balzac, Picasso, and all these other artists we can think of. So uh, being a fan of Monty Python, I thought of John Cleese because he's an exemplary comedian who cannot exactly be substituted even with other members in Monty Python such as Michael Palin or Terry Jones. Thus, we, ca we can't exactly abstract the, not, the homogeneous element out of Cleese's labor, because if you remove his individuality from his performances, you essentially remove him, because he was on the BBC and in movies, because it was his brain, his nerves, and his muscles that were performing that comedy. So some theorists recognize, but do not actually think what I sort of just stated is in fact a problem at all. So instead, what people, some people have done is that they've sort of identified the same thing that I identified, but sort of actually said that this actually shows that capital cannot be ac accumulated from artistry, that artists are actually outside of the definition of abstract labor, so capitalists cannot accumulate from their labor. So this is just a quotation that I'm going uh, I'm gonna read, so it might just be easier for you to, um, to follow along. So, Unlike many other types of workers, capital is unable to make the artist completely subservient to, his, to its drive for accumulation. The reason is simple. Since art is centered on the expressive individual artist, artistic objects must appear as the product of recognizable persons. The concrete and named labor of the artist is always paramount and must be preserved. As socially constituted, artists appear to capital as the antithesis of labor power antagonistic to incorporation in the capitalist labor process as abstract labor. Sorry, there we go. Um, uh, the artist represents the special case of concrete labor, which is ultimately irreducible to abstract value. So while it's sort of maybe a, uh, a, a paragraph that seems very similar to what in fact I just argue, this is where there's actually some methodological problems that actually start to linger. So the way that I put it, and this is actually why I have the theme of all of the, the slides for my part one and part two and all that, is much like a drop of ink in a glass of water, it actually becomes very difficult to then start to actually understand this model once you start to apply it. So if you have this idea that there is some labor that can be reduced to abstract labor and that there's some labor that just fundamentally can't, where in fact do you draw the line? So for instance, I can personally agree with James Adji's praise for the four most recognizable comedians of the silent era, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, and Harry Langdon. But where is sort of the objective foundation for me to state firmly that none of their labor translates into socially necessary abstract labor time? What if someone thinks that, for example, only Chaplin and Keaton are artists? This second assumption implies that the labor times of Lloyd and Langdon are formally subsumed under capital as abstract labor time. Then to add to those questions, what if artists while exceptional in their craft, they've never actually had the same publicity as movie stars, prize-winning writers, pop singers, and fashion designers. So this whole idea of irreducibility seems to actually play on our imagination of we recognizing artists that seem to stamp their names onto their work. So what about the background work of all of these exceptional artists that we don't actually maybe know? or that in fact are very famous in certain social circles or in work circles, but we can't maybe actually decide are they famous enough or quote unquote artistic enough to meet sort of this assumption. Because generally when we think about this argument, it's easier to go to artists that we can all talk about or that we can all agree. So for example, does the theoretical place of someone like Hans Dreyer depend on whether moviegoers recognize his name? And Hans Dreyer was an artistic director who I believe has something like a credit of 500 movies, and he was nominated for 23 Academy Awards. 
But this is a name that might be very familiar to movie buffs, but it might not even be familiar to anyone outside of that. So where do we put someone like him? So some of these things might sort of seem like a bit of nitpicking, but what is actually very important to this is that Marx, when using his idea of abstract labor, he actually wanted to demonstrate that this was sort of the competitive benchmark. So abstract labor time forces capitalists to keep designing and redesigning their manufacturing processes on the basis of what, at each moment in time, is deemed socially necessary. Moreover, these designs can only be said to follow the laws of value if it is possible to find where these productive processes actually deviate from competitive averages. So there's, a, I think, an oft-quoted uh, quotation from Marx where he argues that if a capitalist has a foible for using golden spindles instead of steel ones, the only labor that counts for anything is value of yarn, of the value of yarn remains that which could be required to produce a steel spindle because no more is necessary under the given conditions. So therefore, if it's actually unclear where we actually even put artists and how they would even be treated as abstract labor, it is then unclear where the production of mass culture is actually in excess of any of these averages. So then it becomes unclear whether making a giant blockbuster movie or spending all sorts of money on famous actors and actresses and movie sets, whether that is necessary labor time or it's in excess from some benchmark. So this issue resurfaces when we come to the concept of productive labor. So I'm skipping over a few parts, but I think what is then a really interesting thing to actually start to address is this sort of issue. So when I spoke initially about some of the fuzziness that actually occurred when I started to look at political economic theory with respect to mass culture, I noticed that what tended to happen was you actually started to get varying definitions of how to maybe answer this problem with respect to productivity. So what tended to happen was there would be a clear assumption of what, in fact, is productive with respect to mass culture. So it could be just the mode of production, or it could be the mode of production and the mode of circulation. So it could include advertising and all sorts of things. And what then has actually started to happen with respect to the study of brands and meaning and how we might actually be participating in all of these cultures, whether in fact we as consumers are in fact also productive. So what I frame here in this table is actually three definitions that are aware of the other sides of the argument. So I'm not sort of taking that definition as one is necessarily an older argument. It's, it's sort of three approaches to sort of saying, I'm giving an answer of what in fact is productive when we actually talk about culture. And what I'm gonna do now is sort of go over some of the problems with the three definitions. So the first definition of productive labor preser preserves a very strict distinction between production and circulation, but at the cost of ignoring all of these relevant social dimensions of cultural value. So for Guido Starosta, for example, the mechanical and digital reproduction of culture can never add value. These processes can only, quote unquote, mediate the value that was first created in the production of prototypes of the first copies of artworks. So what he, what he states is this, the value of the aggregate product, i.e. all these reproductions of a commodity, no longer, represents the, no longer represents the simple addition of its constituent elements. Instead, the total value is determined first and then shared out equally by each individual commodity, which now remains, contains a proportional fraction of the former. So similarly to another writer, Simon Mohun, any form of labor that brings buyers and sellers together in this case is unproductive because this form of labor produces nothing, quote unquote, in it, in nothing in addition to what was already in existence. But granting even for the sake of argument that we can actually draw a simple line between the mode of production and the mode of circulation, there's another issue. So for instance, how would we actually maybe then apply that very argument to a sort of, let's call it a cultural universe 
that is either very large and complex and is in fact expanding because people are adding more and more things to it. So for instance, we could try to apply value theory to the production of something as complex as the Star Wars universe. So on the one hand, George Lucas originally created characters, environments, objects, and images for the production of the first three films. On the other hand, the breadth and complexity of this universe, I don't really maybe need to, to belabor this point, has sort of grown in complexity as there's been all sorts of creative additions to this first uh, to this universe. But then the question is, are the first three films the quote-unquote original commodity that determines how every subsequent co commodity of the franchise is sort of a part of this total value? And then how do we account for the reuse of characters that were actually maybe part of a quote-unquote original film, but now they're being reused and recirculated over and over and over? So for example, is value being created or there's no value being created when the reproduction takes place of someone like a character like Han Solo or if it takes place in another medium, so if it's on t-shirts or in a video game, or is this all unproductive advertising? What about when more characters are added but some of the parts of those characters are in fact already there or sort of already branches of what was originally created? So if for instance we have a new Jedi character for example or a new bad guy or a new robot, it's sort of this mixture of something new and something old and what is the proportion of this value that is sort of created or what is there a proportion of some of it that is in fact just simply unproductive and it's not actually a part of this, um, of this issue. So the second definition appears to actually circumvent this problem by stating that uh, the mode of circulation is in fact productive. But now we actually have another really difficult question to ask is how would we actually know when and to what extent the capitalist mode of circulation is productive? So as we saw above, some Marxist theorists argue that the mode of circulation is productive because marketing, branding, artistic creativity, and design are currently necessary parts of the creation of value. So some of the, the authors that I refer to uh, make that argument. But the so-called necessity of it all is actually very difficult to determine. So take, for instance, the decision to pay someone like Jennifer Lawrence $10 million to star in the next big budget action blockbuster. On top of this high wage cost, there are added costs of promoting Lawrence's involvement. But does all of this labor surrounding Lawrence add value to the commodity, the movie? So step one is to determine whether all of this capitalist purchase of Jennifer Lawrence's labor power was in fact necessary for the circulation and eventually the realization of value. But unfortunately, this determination requires that we first know the subjective attitudes of consumers. So if the commodity in mind of the average consumer was a quote unquote Jennifer Lawrence movie, then the cost of hiring her and all the cost of actually getting her advertised and getting her onto talk shows was all necessary. But if the, ad, if the promotion and advertised has actually maybe had little effect on either people seeing that movie and they sort of decided, well, I'm just interested in seeing a good popcorn movie, then it's less clear whether all of this money in fact spent to get an individual artist onto the actual production was necessary. And what actually makes it even more difficult is that as, we, uh, as some of us um, are already interested in or sort of are also sort of trying to analyze, the methodological confusion around circulation is actually exacerbated by all the other forms of power in capitalist society. So there's structural and institutional based forms of repression and what those do is that they sort of unravel the simple one-to-one -one relationship between advertising and consumer behavior. And more specifically, the money spent on advertising and the amount of money that the consumer behavior sort of brings back. Yes, people are currently bombarded constantly with advertisements. But there's also a bunch of blind spots because there could be all sorts of other things within society that actually compel people to do a certain type of consumption. So it was actually Marx who discovered in 1844 that the persistence of alienated labor is actually making people sort of hate their time at work. And in fact, they're treating free time as this sanctuary from both physical and mental activity. Moreover, 
that institutions and other forms of social relations can actually direct our desires or interests in another way. So through the family unit, social taboos, a hierarchical distribution of scarcity, and the control of technological innovation, these are other ways that you can sort of direct the instinctual energies of a population who are sort of to varying degrees maybe deflected into certain forms of socially acceptable forms of consumption. The third definition assumes that consumer activity is also a productive input in the valorization of cultural commodities, but here we could sort of say that the doors are blown sort of wide open. So here we have the mode of production, the mode of circulation, and the mode of consumption all sort of saying these are all now actually contributing to the sort of the, pr the productivity of culture. So one of the main reasons is that I think what people clearly notice is that obviously there is a thematic interest, I think, in a lot of research to look at ideology, cultural meaning, social desire, and all the other forms that people actually behave with respect to cultural um, objects. In itself, that interest is perfectly reasonable, and I would say that that interest is sort of one of the backbones of my own interest. But what is concerning for the moment is that there's a theoretical interest that caused to sort of jump feet first into assumptions about productivity. So making assumptions that consumers are in fact productive additions to an object or a product can actually get very, very tricky. So what it needs to develop is a reliable economic measure of consumer valorization. But problematically, this conceptualization of immaterial and cultural value um, sort of resorts on a modified version of revealed preferences. So coined by uh, Paul Samuelson, revealed preferences was sort of this neoclassical term that sort of actually sort of purported to explain utility through a much more of an indirect method. What it's sort of based on is that if you can assume that the conditions for a competitive economy are there, even if you can't measure utility directly, the behavior of people who actually go out and buy things are sort of actually then revealing the utility that they in fact had. So the third definition actually sort of follow, falls into that same problem. It relies on this idea of revealed preferences because so much of its so-called consumer valorization is in fact obscure, which is also interesting because some of the um, writers actually freely admit this. So the quantitative categories of productivity, such as labor time, are inapplicable to the desires and emotions of consumer behavior. So just as a hypothetical sort of example, two people own Adidas shoes. Do they valorize the Adidas brand equally? Do obsessed fans of Harry Potter novels produce more value than those who just read it and enjoy it for stories with just much less intensity? Does this so-called value-producing consumption need to actually maybe be reduced to some sort of benchmark? So for example, is consumption a skill that is actually possessed to varying degrees? Or can we just simply count the number of people? As a consequence of these potential solutions, the makeshift, the makeshift solution, sorry, as a consequence of these potential problems, the makeshift solution is to work backwards. So what Samuelson did, assuming that his conditions were true, gave according to him, the sort of the theoretical grounds to actually move backwards and say, I can look at prices and move back to actually explain utility. So one solution is to treat immaterial value sort of as a residual, where brand value is a firm's market price minus its tangible assets. So problematically, however, this sort of arithmetic still requires that we can show that brand value is the proven effect of consumer desires and attitude. So in other words, brand value is the pricing of future earning potential and risk of what is oftentimes called brand equity. But under these assumptions, it has to sort of assume that brand equity is this simple, clear revelation of all of the desires and, and all of the productive processes both inside and outside of the firm. So I'll give you an example. You, uh, Google being purchased, uh, purchasing YouTube for $1.65 billion. So this is a quotation from Hugh Wilmot, who sort of makes the claim that you can actually use the price that Google paid for YouTube to sort of, quote unquote, as a sort of residual, 
price the amount of labor power, the amount of value that was added by consumers. So this is what he says. YouTube was acquired by Google for $1.65 billion in 2006, when it just had 65 employees. That is a potent illustration of how the labor of user consumers built the brand equity of YouTube that was turned into brand value. The proceeds of the sale of YouTube were shared amongst those legally credited with owning the site, which is straightforward um, to, to anyone studying business. But what is interesting here is that he then says, to the exclusion of those who provided its content and built its reputation. The capitalist state ensured that legally, the co-producers of YouTube's brand equity had no entitlement to the dollar value generated by their labor. So what Wilmot is doing here is that he's updating a Marxist theory of appropriation. So the shareholders of YouTube were making it rich on the labor time, which in this game came from all these users that were actually making and uploading content for free. But the problem is, is that very suggestion then actually implies that this $1.65 million could have actually been paid to all of the producers if in fact they were given some opportunity to be paid for their inputs. But what is problematic about that is using the economic theory of uh, Thorsten Veblen is that he actually helps us recognize that we're sort of assuming that this $1.65 billion would actually re cleanly reflect each individual's input. So as with other processes in modern industry, this labor of cap cultural goods cannot simply be deconstructed into sort of an atomistic, definable factor. So the complexity of modern industry and the mixture of different commodities in the same production processes all blur the lines of this idea that we could sort of take even something as perceivably as simple as a YouTube video and sort of saying, this in fact can actually be divided with respect to the inputs. One of the main reasons is that even something like a YouTube video actually relies on what Veblen kept referring to as this common stock of knowledge and um, sort of ideas, where this, the inputs of the amount of stuff that is in fact free to us is being inputted into the very things that we are actually creating. So this idea that you can make like a clean definition of one person making a distinct contribution sort of falls at the window. So for instance, the making and uploading of a basketball video on YouTube would never simply be about the labor time of the filmed basketball players of the user who makes, edits, and uploads the content. Rather, the productive process of sharing a video on the internet is dependent on an enormous complex of factors in computer, electrical, and mechanical engineering. Moreover, a video on basketball depends on the existence of this sport, which was invented and developed from the knowledge and material science, organizational behavior, and just frankly, the biological capacities of humans. Additionally, any commentary in the video would rely on a shared human language, such as English or Japanese, and all of these things so far are all free for all. The simple idea that the maker of a YouTube basketball video is tacitly relying on the productivity of semiconductors, binary logic, the invention of synthetic rubber, language, mathematics, and so much other modern technology to create and just upload this simple thing is Veblen's point. The social and technological foundations of modern production render isolated definitions of producti productivity meaningless. Conversely, many of the precursors of industrial cre creation are, by virtue of shared social knowledge, free to all, including businesses. So capital value, in contrast, stands on the aspects of industrial capacity that have been made exclusive through the social and legal institution of private ownership. So these are the aspects, this exclusive right to advertise and sell data to others, this is what is being capitalized when Google is making an offer to buy YouTube. The future earnings, yes, involve many people coming together and in fact sharing videos and building this community. It depends on those. But the capital value is just attached to the copyrights, patented, and ownership titles that allow Google to sell access to what is now withheld from society at large. So are we sort of around a half an hour? Yeah. yeah. OK, so maybe we could just take a break, and then I can move to the, the next two parts. Okay. So maybe if people want to grab some of the snacks and coffee. How many? 15? Yeah. Sure, OK. Yeah.
Okay. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for bearing with me with sort of going through some of the, the reading, but I think even though it might have been a bit dense, it was probably the best way to kind of cover some of those issues. So maybe if there are some questions in the question period of clarification, I'll gladly, uh, gladly, gladly hear those and address those. But for the rest of the rest of the presentation, it's going to be a bit more casual. And I think the reason being that this is something that I've done either a lot of my own work on, but these are some of the questions that I still think about on a daily basis. So it doesn't really maybe require me to kind of be as, as precise and technical, but again, if there's any sort of questions, we can save those to later. So one of the, probably the key reasons why uh, I was actually interested in the capitalist power approach when I started to do my own work on Hollywood is that I saw that there was an opportunity for me to make some of these explorations. So if the first part of this has been asking various sorts of questions, I don't want to make it seem like I've answered all of those questions that I posed, but I at least felt that using the capitalist power approach, I'm actually able to sort of walk through a door and feel that I'm not in fact going to be reproducing maybe the similar problems that I was noticing when I was in fact going through all of this literature. So what we can incorporate is this sort of quote unquote all of these sort of non-economic factors. So if, uh, if other political economic approaches have a either explicit or implicit assumption about the separation between econom economics and politics, by getting rid of that assumption, you can actually, in fact, incorporate all sorts of things and you might be able to do it hopefully still with clarity, but you don't have that same underlying assumption. Now, the way that I frame it here is not how I've always framed it, but maybe in relation to some of the work that uh, Jonathan Nitzen and Shimshon Bickler have been writing on recently in conversation with uh, a colleague of mine, Blair Fix. What is interesting, I think, now is it's becoming clearer and clearer that this approach has some validity in many ways, but one of the parts that it has a validity is that it can sort of look at the scopes of strategic sabotage or the scopes of sabotage in, vari to, in various sizes. So if we start with Veblen, Veblen obviously has a very uh, sort of a monumental importance in this, but I think what Jonathan and Shimshan have been doing and I think what colleagues of mine or researchers that are sort of using this approach is that they're sort of taking the approach and sort of saying that sort of definition of sabotage while useful in many ways needs to sort of be expanded and we might even need to be more creative in defining the ways that capitalist interests might be able to in fact inflict sabotage on society in the interests of either gaining profit or increasing their capitalization, which there is a slight difference there. So this is one of the charts in my dissertation and this was one that actually I think made it very clear that the some of the problems that I was having with respect to the literature, I needed to either try to resolve those problems or see if there's a different method to actually approach because this chart actually sort of demonstrates that trying to explain Hollywood's profits through labor alone runs into problems. So to explain the figure, what we have here is two series on the left, and they're both benchmarked to uh, 100. So they're indexed to 100. We have the major distributors of Hollywood. And when I put real income per firm, what I've done there is I've divided that series by the consumer price index. I then, using global insight data, got the, uh, the total compensation of employees, which would actually be very important with respect to Hollywood because it's not strictly their wage labor. In fact, if you have residuals on a project, you could still make quite a bit of money just working on a film. So this is the labor of Hollywood, benchmarked again to 100 and also divided by the CPI. So by doing that, we can create a ratio on the bottom. And there's multiple things that I find interesting with this figure. But one of the things that is clearly interesting is that the rate of increase of profits is roughly six times or a bit less than six times higher than the labor, the, the compensation to labor. 
So even if one were to make an assumption that this is in fact maybe ex explaining exploitation, which might, you might be tempted to do because you can say, well, this profit is rising faster than the amount of money that uh, labor is getting, you still would actually have to explain why in fact that gap is of that size or why that gap has been able to actually increase from 1950 roughly all the way up until 2003. The more important thing for my work in my dissertation was looking at specifically risk. And one of the reasons was is that as you can see, if you put this as a rate of change, the fluctuations in profit are vastly greater than the fluctuations in the labor. So for my, with respect to my work on uh, my dissertation, a lot of that revolved around me looking at uh, price volatility or the volatility of consumerism and sort of coming up with uh, various ways to explain the shifts in risk in Hollywood, but even if you weren't looking at risk, this figure still says, says a lot, because even if you were just looking at the levels of profit, you still would have to maybe explain what sort of looks almost like a, um, you know, for those that are familiar with business cycles, it has to somehow explain why there are waves in the first place, but why at certain years, the profits in fact shoot up or sort of drop down. So this is a figure that uh, was t that has been uh, sort of taken from uh, Jonathan Nitzen and Shimshon Bickler's latest working paper, and in their response to uh, Blair Fix's work, and it, I, I don't really have time to maybe go into too much of the context, but when Blair sort of refers to institutions, what actually sort of happens here is that what Jonathan and Shimshon sort of point out is if you look at what an institution is, and maybe what might be more specifically called an organization, like a firm, which is much of the data that uh, Blair is looking at, it's not that, that the, definitionally there's a problem. The issue is that if you start to look at things, in this case, the way that hierarchies are actually formed, you can take a more microscopic perspective. So you can look at an institution, and you can look at the hierarchy of an institution. But when they expand things like meso-hierarchies and meta-hierarchies, they introduce this idea that socially, there's many aspects of society that might actually reinforce or create the need for hierarchies, or even the mere fact of teaching people that hierarchies are the necessary way to form organization. So in this paper, when they suggest that there's cooperative alternatives to energy use, it relies a bit on this saying that yes, the data that a lot of the examples and data that we have are, are institutions that have formed hierarchies. But if you sort of maybe dig deeper at maybe the ways that we even culturally or socially reinforce hierarchies, this is why there's very maybe few alternatives of people trying to do more flat cooperative organizations. This is really not something that is kind of set in stone. It sort of was me just quickly using the draw function in PowerPoint. But what it sort of explains is that sort of same issue. So if the part one was kind of muddying the waters with respect of how you actually look at film production and film distribution, if you tried to actually draw the relationships, I don't even know if this is the best way to draw it, but one, you get sort of overlapping circles, but maybe more importantly, when I, in a dissertation or in my research, focus on Hollywood and I talk about ideology, it's not like Hollywood ideology is in a simple container, or some of the values that Hollywood either uses or misuses, or all sorts of things that Hollywood does, it's not like those things are also in simple containers. So if Hollywood either makes a movie that is uh, you know, very problematic or stereotypical or racist or sexist or all sorts of other various forms that Hollywood sometimes maybe draws on ideologies in society in a, you know, either a constructive or more destructive way, the idea is that's not a simple container. That socially, this is something that is much larger. So even just bringing in this idea of ideology into the accumulation of culture gets very difficult. So to give an example of maybe what are the ways that we can start thinking about it. This is just me giving an example of something that sort of has been inspiring some of my latest work and some of the research that is sort of ongoing. So this is actually out, a, out of a scientific report. I was very surprised to find this, but this is actually a um, 
one of the, I guess, uh, sub-publications of Nature. Um, and this is titled Quantitative Analysis of the Evolution of Novelty in Cinema Through Crowdsourced Keywords. Now, most of the paper, the majority of the paper is all more or less strictly computer science. It has a lot of uh, sort of explaining its mathematical models. But maybe naively, the author of this actually sort of touches on what is maybe an important thing to maybe start to think about. So if we talk about the idea of Hollywood either being novel or in fact the opposite, that it actually maybe reuses ideas and regurgitates ideas and recycles them to death, if that is maybe an important factor into the accumulation of uh, to making profit or into accumulating uh, through uh, its capitalization, these this might be actually very important to maybe try to say we need to be a bit more sharp and focus into actually studying this. So just to give a bit of an example of what he's doing, um, this is uh, one of my graphs that actually just sort of takes just the top, I believe it's the top 30 keywords on the IMDb database. So you can search movies through IMDb, and that is in fact what he's doing, but he's using the full data set. So in this case, this is just the 30 most popular keywords um, on IMDb, and the scale is actually quite large. So you can see that character in name title, there's 40,000 uh, entries on the database that have that. But then you have other ones uh, based on novel, murder, F-rated, which I believe is family rated, TV miniseries. Female nudity is much higher than all sorts of other ones like death, teenager, father-son relationship. And you could just take this and you could keep going down and I ordered it by its appearance. Can you explain the numbers? Oh, this is just the count. The count of what? The number of titles on the database. It's not the number of the number of titles on the database that have this keyword attached to the attached to the figure uh, attached to the title so th this is not really that necessary to maybe totally explain the method that he uh, was in fact using but the reason that I'm including this in the presentation is that he's actually making an attempt to sort of try to model novelty and it's obviously not an easy thing to do it's not maybe as as sharp as maybe we uh, would want it to be because you have to make various assumptions and he makes various assumptions but what these two look at and so you can sort of ignore c and d even though that's the sort of the distribution of the years a and b is him sort of trying to create a novelty index so what he does for A is sort of says, I can take all the keywords in the database and I can take all the films and I can order them chronologically. What I want to do is create an index that just counts new keywords being added. So he sets a few parameters. So he tries to sort of set like new words sort of maybe appearing after a lag of time or a, maybe a word that appeared, you know, 10 years ago, but it's now back you know, being used again. So he sets parameters that he's counting in a sort of maybe more rigorous way. And then what he tries to do is actually create an index for novelty. On the one on B, what he's doing is what he's calling combinatorial novelty. So rather than coming up with new words to describe films, he's interested in saying, well, maybe we've used various words over and over to describe films, but is it the combination of them that in fact creates something, in fact, um, new and interesting. So what I find most interesting about these two figures is that it's maybe not as dramatic as other figures, but you can actually see that there is a decrease in his measures of novelty from the 30s up until the 60s, or maybe the late 50s. And this is around the time of the, the Hollywood studio system. Now, when people sort of look at the break of the Hollywood studio system around the 1950s, and then start to maybe start to revel in the new burst of creativity uh, in Hollywood in the 1960s, he sort of sort of demonstrates that even sort of maybe as you know maybe a not a maybe a strict correlation, but something that is maybe suggestive of this, that there is actually a fact in it, an uptick in both of his measures. And then from 1970 onwards, you in fact get back into this measure of novelty 
going back either plateauing or just starting to decrease. So if anyone has maybe had a bit of a feeling that they're watching movies that they've seen before, or they feel like they're kind of rehashing ideas, at least nominally this, these models sort of suggest that there's something about that. Can I interrupt? Mm -hmm. I just want to understand. So he's counting the categories that exist in the database, mm -hmm. but the categories in the database are Ref if, if I understand correctly, <clears throat> they reflect the way that those who made the database constructed it. Yes. It, it, it's not something uh, that is attached to the film by the filmmaker. Right. It's attached by the database managers. So it's essentially the creativity of the database managers, not the filmmakers, isn't it? Well, it's, so it, it is, it's actually, well, so one of the assumptions is that, that is one of the assumptions, but the, maybe what is interesting at least is that it's actually crowdsourced. So the idea would be that this data, that this I is see. actually, people are able to freely add keywords. What creates the addition, the other side of that problem is that someone then can create, add 50 keywords to a film. Like I mm -hmm. can just go to a film and say, kind of like Wikipedia, and I can just start to add various keywords. So it's, so I think some of his assumptions have some of some issues, but I, I at least think, interestingly enough, it's sort of looking at looking at it in a way that might be, you know, uh, maybe worth pursuing. Uh, so I'm not sure if anyone has actually seen uh, this documentary on Jodorowsky's Dune, but what is interesting about this documentary is that it actually looks at um, the Chilean filmmaker Jodorowsky who actually had this grand idea to in fact make Dune. So this was before David Lynch's Dune, I believe in 84 or 85. So this was in the 70s. And Jodorowsky was actually more of an avant-garde filmmaker and he had all these huge ideas for this film. But what is important, I think, with respect to this uh, presentation is that he did a, a vast amount of work assembling artists, assembling artists that would actually sort of sketch out all these grand ideas of how he was actually going to show the world of Dune. He even storyboarded the entire movie. So when he actually went to film studios, he had pretty much the, his imagination of what the film would be in one book. So he would go, this is what the movie is going to look like, and I've sort of, I've done all the details except for shooting it. He had vast, great ideas. The idea, I don't know, I forget the name of the sort of the, the king or the ruler in, in Dune, but he had the, the idea of Salvador Dali being the, uh, the king in it. The, uh, he had Orson Welles, Pink Floyd agreed to do the music. Like this was this huge thing that he sort of thought was going to sort of revolutionize science fiction. It was never made. Film studio after film studio after film studio rejected the film, the idea. But what is important and what sort of actually happens is that this again goes back to the issue with respect to part one. The producer Dino De Laurentiis, who actually owned the rights to the to the production, eventually was able to actually take some of that very same material that was constructed, sometimes out of just out of love. So some of this stuff was actually just done right now on you know a you know a free basis because they were assuming they might have been paid later on, and was able to take some of this material and sort of just chop it up. So famously, um, the German artist Giger, I think that's how you pronounce it was the one that did all the sort of the sketches of all the buildings. And if you Google it, it's essentially what the alien movies all look like. Because they took Giger, they took a few other people, they all went with Ridley Scott to make Alien, and pretty much all of the work that was done for this was in fact just, just taken and put into other movies. So Frank Pavich, the one who made this documentary, says, once we had the storyboards and we really went through them, then certain things popped out. Look at this opening shot. That sounds familiar from Contact. And this scene looks a lot like Raiders, and so on and so forth. So we were kind of discovering it as we were going along, and these were amazing revelations that we would come across. So from a more capitalist power approach, what is interesting about this is this, to some might just appear as this is 
uh, plagiarism or the theft of ideas or the free borrowing of ideas, but from a more cap from a capitalist power or even just from a business standpoint, the more strict definitions are about who actually in fact maybe owns the property rights that allows them to either do this or in other ways get away with it w without actually either being sued or being um, sort of uh, maybe having to remove certain ideas from their films. So it's not just simply a story of maybe other people freely boring these ideas. The whole idea is that all of this labor that could have been paid for was in fact used in other forms but there was no necessity to almost, in my perception, there's no necessity to theorize the, need, the, the value, the almost labor time value of Dune, and it's almost better to look at it with respect to sabotage. So with my, some of my uh, teaching in, uh, at U of T has maybe been spending a little, a little bit more time looking at uh, some of, the, some of the, the background of electrical and computer engineering. But this is where I sort of feel that it might be very important to restate some of Veblen's points and maybe even to reinvestigate how some of these things are even being used in the capitalist power approach. So what I have here is the list of IEEE milestones. So this is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. And these, they list chronologically various milestones in electrical and in um, computer engineering. With respect to Veblen's point in part one, these things completely muddy the water of actually trying to even have a sense of how you actually could say this is how much value one input would actually put into something, particularly when we get into things that are as complex as making a movie that would be requiring or relying on, on some of these innovations. So for example, in 1961 to 1970, James Maxwell has made, oh, oh 1860, 1861 to 1870, made vast contributions in various things like thermodynamics and um, sort of, uh, I think also quantum mechanics and various other things. But the, the whole point is, these things are freely relied on and used on a daily basis in engineering departments around the world. And also just this knowledge is used and then implied in various ways. So if you were to try to put a price on the value of these equations, one, you couldn't because they're free. But more importantly, if you actually even just arbitrarily gave the equation a price and said one equation is worth $5 or $10, you would then just probably get into, it, it might even be in the billions, trillions, or even infinite value because the ways that you would actually have to say these things have an influence on the world we've constructed are so large that you can't in fact make sort of a clean definition of how some of these things have made an impact on us. And more importantly, some of these things are just still freely used today. So I, if, for example, can take something that is no longer patented and I can just freely borrow some of these ideas. So I could look at um, you know, batteries or engines and say, if this stuff is no longer patented, I can freely mine all of these ideas, produce something new and patent that and generate profit, but maybe you know, run theoretically into certain problems if you maintain those assumptions. So with respect to part three, this is more of me just kind of showing some of my ongoing research. But I did at the start of the, at the, start of the presentation ask, is the power of mass culture profitable? And to, before I sort of say yes or no, I think one of the key takeaways is this. So theoretically, we need to maybe rethink how mass culture can become profitable, especially if it is reasonable to investigate ideology, meaning, and other political and cultural dimensions, and explain how those actually go into profit. Because you can find data on profit, but if the idea is, become, is generating a richer conception of how that pro, uh, profit is generated, you might need to you know, rethink some, we might need to rethink some of our theoretical assumptions. And this also means that we have to avoid creating what I'm calling here sort of this fuzziness, whereby on the one hand, we have a theory of accumulation, but on the other hand, our historical research sort of implicitly undermines or confuses the use of that theory. So if I 
holds to a certain conception of uh, that a sort of a productive conception of profit and then I start looking at Hollywood, I might go into vast fields of different aspects of politics and culture, but what does it then mean for me to still hold some of these ideas? So if, for example, Hollywood's story of profit includes massive state investment, major diplomatic relations, copyright protections, monopoly restrictions, ideologies of pleasure, Americanism, what is the purpose of framing accumulation in terms of accumulating productive human labor. So the rest of the, the presentation is gonna be going over some of, the, some of the figures that I've generated. And if anyone has any questions on how I uh, did some of this, or if you have any questions of my methods or sort of that, I, I can gladly answer that. But panel A at the top does sort of give an answer about whether in fact Hollywood is at least accumulating profit. So what this is looking at the top is what I'm calling here is a differential operating income. So operating income is the income of a, a generally it's the income of a business segment. You can also get the operating income of a total firm. But most importantly, I was looking at operating income because I couldn't in fact find net income for business segments because that is actually calculated and stated for an entire company. So if you are AT&T or Google, you do have a column that has net income, but if you look at maybe its algorithms or its advertising segment, it might in fact have a list of income, but it's not net income, it's operational. The differential measure is me benchmarking this against the um, what is my sort of uh, my sort of proxy for the S and P 500, which I which I think I called in my dissertation the dominant capital 500. So this is taking the 500 largest corporations each year that are listed in the United States. I take their operating income and I average that, and I use that as a benchmark that Hollywood is in fact trying to beat. So we can see that. If we, if we just looked at it without this measure, we could see that Hollywood is in fact profitable year after year, that it is making some profit. But what this benchmark shows from 1955 all the way up into 1980, this has been its sort of its period of a boom in accumulating differentially. And then from around 1985 all the way down to 2015, it's either going sideways or in 2000 to 2015, actually in fact, sloping downwards. And to explain some of the figures that I'm going to be looking at later, what is important with respect to the bottom series is that I'm looking at ticket price and the number of film releases as rates of change. And the reason that there's gray bars on these figures is that for every three years, there's either a negative rate of change in film releases, so they're decreasing the number of films they're making, or they are increasing for three years straight US ticket price above the rate of inflation. So it's actually increasing in addition to the increases of US inflation. I use both of those as a way to sort of then create these gray bars, and the darker gray bars are where both of them overlap. This creates me looking at what Jonathan and Shimshong in their work argue is a form of accumulating through depth. And accumulating through depth, as you can see in this case, is about making fewer movies or, and or, sorry, raising prices faster than the rate of inflation. So from 1955 to 1980, that is one of their biggest boom periods but also that is the period where it is pretty much a depth strategy the whole way. From 1985 to 2015, we have, I guess you could call more pockets of the depth strategy, but what I argue elsewhere, or at least try to answer elsewhere, there is a sort of a boost in profits from 1990 to 1995, in differential profits, sorry, but that is one of the rare periods, if you look at the rate of change, where there's actually a sort of spike in producing more movies on the average. And the reason that that is actually very important to maybe understand some of the, the next sort of aspects of the charts 
is that if I'm actually going to bring other aspects of mass culture into a theory of accumulation, I might need to sort of label, I might need to frame it in a certain way that sort of understands what are maybe some of the relationships between what Hollywood is doing, what people are doing. Maybe Hollywood makes a new change or they do something different or they make a different type of movie. And does that maybe create a sort of reaction on the consumer side? Or alternatively, are consumers doing something that might create sort of a reaction on the Hollywood side? So the way that I framed it here is that I'm looking at the social foundations of a depth strategy. So Hollywood, like any other business, can sort of, you know, from its own perception, do what it wants. It can sort of say, this is the strategy we're doing. But what they might be more concerned about is, if we do certain things, so if we start to stagnate the number of films, or if we raise movie prices, or if we start to make more and more blockbusters, or if we start to just keep making more and more franchises, what effect is this going to have? Is this going to actually maybe undermine the foundations that we have? So if there are, we can you know maybe co commonly agree that there are lots of people that are fans of Hollywood movies. Are some of these strategies going to make people get sick and tired of their movies? Are people just not going to mind and they'll just oh I'll just keep consuming them regardless? So you know in the bottom here I can say, for example, how many franchises are there? And how many franchises can Hollywood in fact mine? So for example, are we sort of now left with reboots and lesser franchise characters and seems what Disney is now doing with Star Wars, are we now that we've gone through Harry Potter and Twilight and all these other ones, are we maybe even just running out of maybe some of these things? And Hollywood might need to consider this because if it's making fewer movies, it might need to think what are these few movies that we're going to make? The other one is that, and this is where some of the figures that I start to look at more of, what I'm trying to do now is look at some of Hollywood's more, either its artistic side or at least the side that it wants to present as being artistic. I feel like the art versus comment, commerce, although a very um, simplistic dichotomy, at least is important, I think, is in one aspect, is that Hollywood has had sort of a dilemma since the 1930s, which has been, we want to sort of make various movies that are very popular, but even out of their own creation by creating the Academy of, uh, the Academy of Arts and Motion Pictures and now starting to get very bigger with its awards, it's run into always this sort of back and forth dilemma of can we make movies that are you know, just mindless popcorn films, but can we also make movies that sort of show that Hollywood is in fact artistic? And the reason that that can become a problem is that they theoretically want you to be watching both, or at least when they sort of, um, when I talk about this, you know, the, the official words on the teleprompter is that when Hollywood has its award shows, this is in fact what it sort of claims. It sort of says Hollywood and just movie making in general sort of shines a light on the world. And, you know, in the more, in the more cliched sort of sentence, it can, you know, movies can make us think, laugh and cry. But Hollywood is in sort of this dilemma of saying, we do make some blockbusters that are mindless, but we also make some uh, artistic fare, regardless of what you think about those, but they're at least trying to claim that that's happening. But with respect to sabotage, you can run, and we're, sorry, the accumulation through depth, you can run into the same problems. So is what has Hollywood been doing in the past sets of years, which is reducing the number of movies that it's making and increases movie prices, what is this actually doing to this relationship? Is it destroying independent cinema in the United States? Or what is even happening to its own in-house production companies? Or maybe what are actually happening on the consumer side? Are people actually consuming alternative movies? Or is this maybe not as much as a problem with respect to what Hollywood wants? So if you can uh, recall, so maybe I can actually just quickly go back to so you can recall. So from 1980 to 2015, we actually in fact see a downward slope. So we do see that with respect to the level of differential income, Hollywood has been running into a bit of a problem that is actually going downwards. My other work looks at risk, which kind of looks at it from a different frame, but at least from this figure, we can see that there's an issue. So what I do here is I take movie, the box office mojo data, I 
filter out any movie that is not distributed by a major studio. So the way that I set my parameters is that it's it has to be explicitly distributed by one of the big studios. They do have sister corporations or sometimes these other smaller uh, distribution houses, but I decided just to start, I was gonna be what movies are clearly distributed by the Hollywood majors. And what I wanted to look at is this sort of question is, is its focus on maybe it's trying to increase profits or in try to increase profits by relying on blockbusters, we all sort of maybe commonly know that blockbusters are also very expensive to make. And one of the common arguments in the literature is that Hollywood is running into a problem, which is in fact that it is increasing the amount of money that it's spending just to make these blockbusters and this might actually either eat into its profits or create problems where it might one day become unprofitable. So both measures are similar, but they use just something slightly different in the denominator, um, only because uh, in another series that's not shown here, I actually show that it's fair to do so. But what we have on the top is attendance per cost per film. And the reason that I do that, so what we have is a total, the attendance for the, uh, the, attendance for the films and the um, numerator, and in the denominator, we have the average cost times the number of films. Now, the reason that I do that is that this is sort of what shows maybe what is Hollywood's dilemma, because what it might want to do is not spend less money. So the reason that it's hard to look at Hollywood as a, as, a, as a place that wants to spend less money is because it doesn't really do that. It spends more and more money. It sometimes throws tons of money at a project. So if you want to call it cost cutting, it's not about reducing the amount of money it's spending because it's not. You want to look at it with respect to how much attendance can it actually get relative to the amount of money that it's spending. So if can for a, hmm? Can I ask you, yep. uh, there are two series yep. so in each graph. So what do they represent? Oh, the other one I believe represents, um, that might actually be my minor film data. I realize that that's actually still there. Okay. So the, it would be the dark, it would be the dark gray line, the dark line that we want to be looking at. If you can see the two series, but thanks for the clarification. I actually forgot that, <laughs> that I did that. So, but what is important with respect to this is that it, this series could actually go up even if prices are if costs are increasing, because the reason that it can go up is that you, the numerator could actually be rising faster. So attendance can be shooting up faster than an increase in cost. But what the series actually show is really the opposite, where maybe money spending has actually maybe put Hollywood into a bit of a trap where it's actually not maybe able over this time series to increase attendance relative to the amount of, sp amount of money that it's in, in fact spending. And more importantly, the number of films is decreasing, so this should actually give it maybe more of a chance to actually increase attendance per film because there's less films, but still it's sort of running into this problem. And the reason that that's important is because this is a figure that sort of tries to show what maybe Hollywood is doing with respect to consumer behavior. So what this, what this looks at is franchise data, but what it tries to do is it tries to actually compare it to US attendance per capita. So that dotted line that's hovering around five and is now actually decreasing to four is the US attendance per capita for all fil theatrical films in the United States. So when you put it as per capita data, you're actually sort of showing that on average, so maybe you know, one person sees 30 movies a year and one person sees zero movies a year, but the idea is per capita as a measure, the average American from 1975 more or less up until 2005 was seeing five movies per year in theaters. And now that's actually decreased to four. So what I've sort of theorized in past presentations is that some of its pushes with respect to focusing on blockbusters has mainly tried to maybe try to get this bottom series to increase. So this is franchises per capita. So this is the on average how many franchises. 
you are, uh, you know, not you, but Americans on average are seeing. And on the bottom, this just actually just counts the number of franchises that, that are in the database. So in fact, as we can see, there are just now also more franchises that are trying to get the job done. But what is sort of being shown here is that from 75 to 90, Hollywood was able to get about one out of five movies you saw a year as a franchise. Now it's getting closer to two, maybe a bit less than two, but if I rounded that up, it'd be now two out of four. So it's getting into a case where if you're even seeing less movies a year, Hollywood might be getting into a situation when they can at least say, at least with respect to the money we're spending or focusing on blockbusters, we're getting people to devote a proportionally larger portion of their habits to our blockbusters. What, what is a franchise? So a franchise in the definition of this is any film that has actually been either adopted from um, a, a book series, but with respect to if it's a book series, it's then it's being produced as a, like, a, like an actual series of sequels. So it's not just adapting something from a novel, because in that case, it would be multiple things. But it also then includes the um, adaptation of video games, television, and I'm right now just using what Box Office Mojo defines as franchises. But the other one would also be included the other side of that. So something became a franchise because it then expanded into other things outside of movies, but now it's included as a franchise. So I think the one in 19, the few in 1975, so like for example, they weren't big franchises relative to now, but Godfather would be considered maybe a, one of the first franchises. So out of curiosity, I decided to maybe look at the other side of that. And that is to maybe look at what might be happening even within movies that are even nominated for Oscars. So the Oscars relative to other awards is by far the most famous one. And for those that are maybe more familiar with other film awards or even just other films, they can sometimes sort of say that there's many great movies that are not even nominated for an Oscar. But what is interesting, I think what I wanted to do with this figure is just sort of take it a bit more naively and say, well, Hollywood does nominate movies for Oscars. It does sort of glamorize and sort of say, these are things that we in fact want people to see, or at the very least it wants you to watch the Oscars. So what I do here is a few things. So the, the dark line, the time series is just the winners and a three year moving average. So there's only one year, uh, one winner per year for best picture, so this is the best picture award. And I make it a centered three year moving average. So rather than having it trailing, it's just sort of centered. So I think it maybe goes from 1973 or four up to 2015, but the series is just centered. But what that is is the winners and it's a three year moving average. This is the attendance for those films. The box plots are five year chunks, except for this smaller one, because that's actually where they changed their nomination. Oh, it's actually, I believe, 10 year. Uh, 10 year, then 2000, 2005, I think is a five or six year, and then there's a, um, a nine year, but forget that for a second. Importantly, that is a group of films that are all nominated for um, the best picture. So these are the ones that didn't win, and rather than plot them individually as a series of dots, the box plot sort of gives sort of a summary of that distribution. So the box on a box plot is the interquartile data. So that's sort of between the 25 and 75 percentile. And then the long sort of arms are the, not they're not exactly the outliers because outliers would be a dot, but they're sort of the, on the ends of the spectrum. So it's either the, 75th to 100th percentile or the 0th to 0 to the 25th percentile. But the most important part is just to sort of get a sense of maybe the spread, but also just the, the, you know, sort of where the box is sort of showing. The line in the box is the median. So that is the, the middle film in those, uh, in those database, in those um, box plots. So 
I don't know exactly maybe how to interpret this data uh, you know, as sharply as maybe some of my other work, but I can at least point to some things that I find interesting. One of the things that I find interesting is that at least from 1975 to around 2005, seven, six, that the winner more or less was more, that it had a tendency to be more popular than the distribution of the other films. Now, that could be retroactively, so the data could just be something one, so people go back and see it in theaters, and that's entirely possible. But what I find so interesting about the winners is that the winners, in fact, is actually on a decline. So as we start to hit the late 2000s, we're getting into situations where the best picture winner, only five to 10 million people in the United States are seeing this. And what is more interesting about that is that in some of the past few years, maybe with respect to some of the criticisms of the Oscars, for example, the hashtag Oscars so white, some of the films that have actually been winning these Best Picture Awards have sort of been, even within the Hollywood circles, being swept up in sort of this like, um, in the fanfare of maybe a more liberal Hollywood addressing controversial issues like race. So we have things like 12 Years a Slave and Moonlight. And you know, the more unfortunate side of it is that the data sort of shows that really in the past maybe decade or so, even the Best Picture winner is not really being seen in theaters. The box on the right is another really interesting thing. So I don't know if people watch the Oscars, but now nine movies are nominated for the best picture. And the explicit reason is nobody is either watching the Oscars or nobody is watching the films that we're actually nominating. So what the nine nominations is allowing them now to do is as you can see, the spread is now huge. So you have some films that only one million people are actually seen. But now you're getting some films that a hundred million people are seen. So it's sort of maybe trying to return back to the 1970s, but in a different way. It's now just taking some blockbusters and saying, we'll nominate them for best picture. And that will either increase our legitimacy as, uh, as an award um, system, or maybe even just getting people to pay attention to us because we, as I hopefully showed in other figures, might actually be destro destroying some of uh, the own foundations of our artistry. So just a few more, but these are some things that I've been working on lately. So I got access to a data set that has all of the Rotten Tomato data scores. And it is set as critic scores and as I believe it's like user score or something like that. There are multiple problems of how a Rotten Tomato score is actually made, but for those that are familiar with it, it's a percentage. So usually based on the number of reviewers that come in, something gets rated fresh because it has 98% of critics love this movie, or it's considered rotten, 9% of critics hate this movie. So it has some problems in its own methods, but I'm just taking the data for now as a way to get a sense of, that's, of what is actually happening. So in the top one, I'm just putting it as a density plot, which is essentially just a different version of a histogram. It's more of a smoothed histogram. So what you can see here is the entire data set. So there's 2,246 movies in the top figure. And this is just a curve of just showing the distribution of scores. So you have a majority of them that are getting 75 to 100, and then that sort of slopes downwards. There's kind of like, I guess, a, a fat middle around 25 and 75, and then there's a sort of a tail down where there are some films that are getting a zero to 25 rating, but it's not as much. So the first thing that I did out of curiosity was just group them by year. So what I did was I wrote a script that was actually able to match the titles to then actually add year data to this. And what this shows, I think, is already sort of revealing of a, of a changing trend. So for example, from 1982 to 1989, which is the red line, you have something that is maybe visually more similar to the top one. But if you then look through the other years, you're starting to notice that the distribution is starting to become, in fact, more just kind of, I guess, like a, a bowl of jello or the outback rock. It's just this kind of U 
And what is important about this is that I then took it and compared it based on the number of opening theaters that these movies actually received. And in some of my other work, I rely quite a bit on opening theater data to actually make arguments about risk, but I think that this is also quite interesting in some important senses. So one of them is just visually, you can actually see that critics, I guess on average, tend to give most of their favorable reviews to movies that are in fact in the bottom 50th percentile in their opening sizes. So if a movie is opening small, so only in one or two movies you know, in the States, or if it opens only in 10 theaters, that's all the ones that would go into the pink. The blue would be films that are in the above 50th, and this is where we're getting more into blockbuster territory, or even just films that are getting a lot more support in advertising. So generally critics, I don't want to say they're staying honest, but what they're doing is that generally there is sort of a difference. But what is also kind of interesting is that if you plot that over time, you can actually start to see that difference start to actually change. So what is happening is they're generally saving their most favorable reviews for smaller films. But this big blob of sort of, um, you know, big Hollywood films is actually becoming much more of a thing where sometimes critics are openly critical of these movies. They give them, you know, 5% on rot Rotten Tomatoes or 7%. In relation to the other um, figures that I showed with this, is that what I want to show is that there's actually becoming a new trend and it has nothing to do with productivity, which is how Hollywood can get around this problem. So if I can just quickly go back here, if it's in fact the case that you know, people are, critics are you know, openly criticizing, or maybe not always openly, but the fact is if you know, sometimes a negative review can circulate, what some of my work has actually tried to look at is the ways that Hollywood is in fact closing the window of a theatrical performance. So the number of days that a movie is in theaters. And it almost seems sometimes counterintuitive. So it sometimes might to think that if a movie is going to make tons of money, it in fact would have to be in theaters longer. That's actually not the case. It's the other way around. So generally what happens is, and this maybe isn't you know, the most sort of uh, you know, downward diagonal, but there is a downward trend where this is the, all of the films um, in my data set, I forget the number, the total number at this moment, but the idea is generally movies that are making more money are actually in theaters um, for a shorter length of time. And movies, that make less money on general, there are obviously some clear exceptions, generally are in theaters sometimes actually longer than the counterparts that are making way more money than them. And what this shows is that this actually shows that if we take all of that movie data, that on average, the movie window in theaters is in fact closing. So what is happening here is that you have 2000 to 2003, and then other, I, I believe, three-year groups, but then the last group is four years. And what you have here is that you can actually see that the average number of days that movies are actually in theaters is in fact narrowing. So the average for maybe the pink is somewhere around 100, maybe slightly above that maybe, but the idea is that this is actually favoring some of its big blockbusters already. Uh, can I ask you a yep. question, technical question? So mm -hmm. if you connect these two figures, the first one and the second one, yep. so the previous one, if you can flip it into it. So the uh, downward sloping line, I think, uh, would have been much steeper if you didn't use uh, a log scale. Yes. Right. Uh, now, if I understand it correctly, the reason it's downward sloping, because the number of films here uh, uh, in, in fact, involves a cross-section time series. So it's films from different periods. Is that yes. right? Yeah. So, so the films on the right will be films that are different in, in terms of when they appeared, the films right. on the left. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that at least for now, I mean, what um, 
I, this was me almost just sort of saying like, what, what does it actually look like if I plot all of the series? So this is just all the films and I just used a, okay. a way just to group it so it's not just dots. So you, as you can see, it's um, hexagons. But the idea is that at least this is a way for me to see the whole thing. But I'm much more interested in the fact that you can actually see this sort of happen. So I, I want to thank all of you guys for uh, listening to my presentation. I know it had a part on uh, some reading and it also had some part where I was showing some of my work. Uh, I'll gladly sort of take some, um, some questions from the audience if anyone has some. And thank you very much. Yeah. OK, so we'll open the floor. Uh, first question. Anything at all. <laughs> Small, big. Okay, let let me let me ask you then a question. Mm -hmm. uh, your previous work, uh, and I need to refresh my memory on this, was that uh, profitability of the the large studios was not something to write home about in differential terms, but capitalization was differential capitalization was rising while differential profitability was moving sideways. And your explanation was that uh, this has something to do with lower risk. Mm -hmm. uh, are you suggesting here that this model is perhaps no longer working? Um, I don't think that I'm necessarily suggesting that it's no longer working. But I think what I am curious about is maybe the the other side of that. And the reason that I say that is because well, with a lot of my interest in risk, I was using some of these figures or data that was similar to this in a slightly different way by demonstrating that if it could actually reduce things like volatility of attendance or volatility of profits, that with respect to a understanding of differential capitalization, this is in fact a, a gain for Hollywood. What was a bit of an unanswered question in my dissertation was, would there be potentially some limits or some problems with that push? So maybe if we can say we've seen Hollywood in the past 30 years focus more on blockbusters, focus more on uh, franchises reducing fewer films, I hope what my dissertation shows is that there's a clear reason what they be how they benefited from that. I think now that I'm maybe turning my attention to profit, or at least the level of profit, it's starting to come to maybe a question of, is there any evidence that, I, I mean, just to maybe loosely put it, because it's not totally framed, is has Hollywood sort of put itself a bit into, not a box, but into a difficulty with its system? If it wants to reduce volatility, that's great. But if it ever gets into a situation, and I don't exactly know how to articulate that situation, but if Hollywood then wants to say, well, we actually want to increase the levels of our profits, it seems that what it's actually achieved has come at some of a cost. So it has marginalized, at least I would argue, it has marginalized certain films, and it has given an attention to, to its, its blockbusters, but hopefully what I showed with the cost data or attendance is that it's not actually able to get a, like a, a new burst of increase of more people seeing films. So if the, if the per capita attendance is at four, if it was at five and it's declining to four, Americans are starting to see less films in theaters. The other difficulty is then can you ever get that to kind of, I guess, kind of like get that explosion back and get people to actually go back into theaters. The other thing that is not here, which I'm also working on, is starting to figure out international data. So some of my work is starting to look at China with respect to some of Hollywood's newest sort of pushes into the Chinese film market as maybe a way to counter some of the downward attendance trends in the United States. Uh, OK, I just want to follow up on that. Um, so. In your uh, dissertation and, and articles, you show that uh, risk has declined to uh, basically uh, 
the lower asymptote. It's, it's almost impossible to decrease risk further. So if that is a correct characterization, it means that you can no longer increase capitalization by making Hollywood more certain. And that means that the only way to do it is to uh, increase profitability faster than the average. And what you've shown is that this is not happening. So it is possible, theoretically, that Hollywood is uh, basically uh, the model that was working in the past 30 years uh, is reaching its asymptote in some sense. And Hollywood might be facing uh, an existential threat. And, and it's an interesting question because uh, it could be that it will be resolved by, you know, breaking grounds into other parts of the world, or it could uh, wither. Right. So that was kind of part, half a question, half, half a, an observation. Yeah. So if, for example, I can go back to this, some of the more qualitative story would be that if we look maybe from 1965 to 1975, or maybe all the way up into 1980, film historians, um, you know, they might disagree on some of the details or which movies apply to this, but qualitatively, people would sort of peg this period as maybe what is called New Hollywood. So one of the times where, in fact, Hollywood maybe kind of maybe let loose a bit more on hiring younger directors, making more either controversial or risky films. I don't have the data um, on this USB right now, but the risk at that stage was at its highest. So it won maybe in the differential operating income game, but it, with respect to reducing risk, it was losing. By making a few decisions, it started to focus on reducing risk, and it might be running into a problem where it needs to ask, can we ever get into a situation where if we can't increase risk, we can keep risk low, but also increase profits. Because obviously if they, you know, I don't know what scenarios they're thinking of, but the 70s generally in the business literature is this a time where it's usually kind of feared. People don't really want to go back to that. It's not like this is an option where Hollywood is saying, if only we could sort of get more creative people. It seems that they actually have many creative people or they could get more creative artists, but they might not be interested in sort of letting, you know, maybe the reins uh, loosen a bit because it might increase profits, but it might open the doors to a return of volatility. Okay. Anybody wants to ask another question? Loosen up. You have no risk. <laughs> no risk. <laughs> Yes, you want to ask a question there? No, you just came to uh, <laughs> close after us. Okay, so James, thank you very much oh, for a very uh, oh, wide-ranging. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I retract. Um, you mentioned at the beginning. No, you have to speak to the mic. So. Yeah. You uh, you mentioned at the beginning the the idea that um, with the alienation of labor, people. Uh, want their time away from work to kind of like turn their brain off like they right. don't want to have to think um and do you think that the the decline in the perceived artistic value in films and the then the actual decline um presents kind of a challenge to that idea that that people want to that they don't want to pursue kind of like a, a like they don't want to. They don't want to challenge when they. Right. So I, I think um, I, in fact, in a ways, um, my my short answer is actually yes. But I'll sort of maybe explain that answer. So uh, I think when I at least when I was um, when I was referring to Marx with respect to alienation, alienation, I think what he demonstrated, but you can also find this in other um, thinkers, is that he sort of showed that there's almost sort of like, like a structural effect of capitalism. So if you create a certain mode of labor, a mode of production, sorry, you create a situation according to him where it's very clear that, you know, he has all these very colorful metaphors in the 1844 manuscripts about how, you know, people, you know, they love going home and relaxing and eating and sleeping and all this idea of like labor and work is kind of fearful or hated for them. 
I think that as a concept to explain the structural, the, uh, a structural effect is totally fine. I think in the details, it's a much more difficult thing because that's something that I have always tried to resolve even when I'm working on this. So at least I think, and I don't think it's me being like hopeful, like hoping that people want more creative movies. I think if you start to look at some of the details of Hollywood, or even if you start to be like, when is Hollywood either repeating itself or just counting the number of franchises, you can start to get into a situation where you can say, you know, I can reasonably assume that this has some sort of cost, that we can't assume that it's always that people just automatically want franchises. That maybe in relation to the way that I answered it uh, with Jonathan, is that there might be a point where that push is gonna become too much, where so, you know Hollywood is gonna say like, we need even simpler movies, or we need even more straightforward plots. That might be a point where people say, you know what, like I'm tired of watching these films. Is, that might be a reason maybe why the per attendance capita is decreasing. It could also be piracy and all the other reasons, all the other ways that we now consume things. But I totally agree that there's there's something in there to, to at least think about and to not exactly ignore. Because I, I really, I don't think I was framing it that way, but I also do just hope that I'm not presenting my stuff sort of saying, like, this proves that ideology works. It's more that they're sort of trying to kind of push this in a certain direction. Okay. Another question, maybe? All right, uh, James, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you.